So I'm going to be talking about my story, which I'm calling What Does a Coder Do If They Can't Type? But I'm also going to be presenting a manifesto, which I'm calling Accessible Means Hackable, right? So I'm going to talk about my story, yes. And part of my story is about how I dictate my code and how disabled people take ownership over their adaptive technology. Uh, and then we have to talk, though, about why it's so hard to find uh, adaptive technology that's hackable in the way that we need. And then I'm going to talk about you and what you can do to enable disabled people to serve their individual needs, but also because those of you who are able-bodied are only able-bodied for now. I'm sorry to break it to you. We are going to spend a little time talking about the care of your hacker hands, uh, how you can take care of your body and how you should respond once taking care isn't enough. So first I wanna talk about who I was. Uh, I'd been programming since the age of 12 and I was a PhD student studying computer science and machine learning, natural language processing. Uh, in my spare time, I also enjoyed programming in a variety of languages. I had other hobbies as well, martial arts, bicycling, knitting, needle felting. So I, uh, I had a lot going on in my life. Now I'm going to talk about who I am. Uh, so first off, uh, I, uh, in 2015, there we go. In 2015, <laughs> Pain I was ignoring in my hands built to a level where I couldn't ignore it. And not only that, but I couldn't even uncurl my fingers. So doctors were completely baffled. And for about a month, I couldn't do anything but drink vodka with a straw. And I like to tell that like it's a joke a lot of the time. But the fact is that I've been in pain now for five years. So who am I? I couldn't do the same craft hobbies that I did. So I got into comedy, service work, social media overuse and uh, reading obsessively. I couldn't do martial arts or biking, but I needed a contact sport in my life, which is how I started roller derby. This is me knocking someone over. My roller derby name is Gaussian Retribution. Yeah, but uh, what could I do about programming? I couldn't type, I couldn't write, and that's how I got into voice coding. Just by dictating all my code with Talon, I managed to resume my PhD. I've written code and papers on understanding the training dynamics of language models, um, learning, uh, trying to understand why they're biased towards linguistic structure. And I really enjoy my work. When just a few years ago, I couldn't imagine any path forward that didn't involve some kind of miracle cure. When you have a disability, every path forward requires that you ensure that technology serves your needs and not the needs imagined by someone else. So that means that your tools have to be hackable. And I'm going to use my case as an example. So Talon, it's a scriptable interface for dictating code. And the thing that sets it apart from a standard speech to text system, um, like the default one for Dragon or the built-in system on many computers, is that it offers a powerful API. So programmers can customize it with their own macros and scripts. Uh, so you can set specific commands that only work with a particular app, or even with a particular file extension. So that means you have separate keywords for working with a Python file or a C file. And there's a dedicated community who create individual libraries of commands. So there are people who make them for Perl or make them for Julia or for some random app. A lot of the basic functionality um, gets added. So keywords represent combinations of symbols uh, common commands like command shift s, uh, but also like combination of symbols where you go open parentheses versus a function call that's two parentheses versus a, uh, a command that says, oh, open parentheses. And also I want to dictate in between the parentheses, press a left arrow. 
Uh, it has its own phonetic alphabet. So if I wanted to say my own name, I would say sky near, air odd, made sit. Um, sky means uppercase. So um, the ability to have macros, though, is also really important. And when it comes to difficult to dictate commands and strings, for instance, I have a command setup that just repeats the previous command. So a common use case of this is I'm doing something like substituting a particular word with another word, and I don't want to do a global substitution because um, I want to check each individual word. So maybe the substitution command is annoying to dictate. So I would just say creek over and over again to repeat the previous command. Another command that I have set up is an indexed clipboard. Because it's so important to not have to repeat yourself a lot, it's useful to be able to have multiple ad hoc commands to represent strings. So you might use this to copy every variable name that you've dictated individually. So you can later refer back to them with easily pronounceable keywords rather than having to repeat your like alphabet soup of abbreviations and underscores. So after selecting a particular phrase using my cursor control commands, I say clip keyword. And every time I want to enter the same phrase after, I say paste keyword. I therefore only have to dictate a particularly obnoxious variable name once. However, it does introduce the new challenge where every variable has two names, its written name and its spoken name, which exacerbates the difficulty of naming variables, the hardest problem in computer science. Um, and by the way, when I do sarcastic quotes, I can only do this. <laughs> That's one effect of my disability. Okay. Um, this is actually one of a number of commands that um, are just re-implementations. I re-implemented that one from a previously popular co voice coding system, which was called voice code. Um, because a lot of the Talon community came from the voice code community, it was useful for us to re-implement a lot of commands. Lots of people even replaced the phonetic alphabet that was used in Talon with a phonetic alphabet that was the voice code default, so they didn't have to learn a new phonetic alphabet. Uh, in a way, that kind of thing is probably recognizable to people who are power users of uh, Emacs or Vim, where every user has their own config file. And in order to get the most out of a system uh, like that, you really do have to know the scripting or the command language behind it. Um, if you're looking to get into voice coding, the best way is to just look through all the different scripts on the Talon community repository. Uh, that way you can see the tools others find useful. There's no single standard set of commands or workflow. So it's just about what you find useful. And some people even use like eye tracking systems to replace their mouse. Uh, now everyone probably wants a quick demo. The way I would say this is shrink integer scoosh word main call scoosh kirkshock word print prex coif phrase hello world ricky semi so yeah in order to learn these commands um i added script gradually from the community repository um joined the slack pasted the command list on my wall at home uh, in front of my desk and also because that's not like the only place that i work I also covered the whole wall around my bed with uh, the printed out commands. So, and I, and I would also pick a command of the day each day uh, and try to use it. But it's not hard to find communities like Talons, which are full of disabled people who are fulfilling their own needs and building their own tools and modifying those tools. So another good example is uh, blind programmers. And a while ago, I talked to a blind programmer who's in my field about his setup, and he had this elaborate configuration built with Emacs Speak. So his browser, his messaging, any work he did was just a screen reader interfacing with Emacs plugins. And this actually isn't an unusual setup for a blind programmer who uses Linux. Now, I had a good friend from undergrad who also happened to be blind, and his screenwriter, his screenwriter was so elaborate, it had syntax highlighting and everything, 
And one day I asked him, oh, you use Emacs speak, right? And he just laughed and said, I don't use Emacs as my operating system. And it turned out he used Orca, which is the screen reader that comes with GNOME. I just want you to think about this. Not only are there multiple options uh, with elaborate configuration options that were developed by blind people for their own needs, but there are so many platform options that someone can make a selection based on what is, frankly, aesthetic criteria. They didn't want Emacs as their operating system, right? Um, so that's the strength of the blind programmer community. It's basically a paradise as far as I can tell. It's this ideal world where everyone's able to make their own modifications that are appropriate for their own work. Uh, even though there's a huge number of programmers with RSI, uh, repetitive stress injuries, the number of programmers for people who don't want to use their, uh, the number of platforms for people who don't want to use their uh, hands is pretty limited. And they often struggle to integrate them with proprietary speech recognition systems. So um, let's talk about why we don't have this paradise. Uh, I think there are three factors for why disabled people's tools are not hackable. There's the drive for profit, there's contempt for accessibility and adaptive technology as a field, and there's patronizing attitudes towards disabled people. First, we're going to talk about profit. So like many people who dictate to a computer, for years I depended on Dragon. Dragon is a proprietary piece of software developed by Nuance, which was available for Windows and OSIX. Uh, they weren't really good speech recognition alternatives at the time, which is why everyone depended on it. And then in 2018, Nuance discontinued support for and sales of Dragon on OSX, which is what I depended on at the time. And it just wasn't profitable, which meant that an essential service for many disabled people just like no longer existed. Uh, and because it was proprietary, the software was no longer available. It's because of this that Ryan Heilman, the programmer behind Talon, has actually been developing free alternative models that are easier to integrate with, which is really nice. Um, but we can talk about another example from the diabetic hacker community. Diabetics don't have a functioning pancreas, so that's the organ that monitors your blood sugar level and changes your insulin level so that it doesn't get too high and it doesn't get too low. So a typical diabetic medical equipment has uh, for a long time included a blood testing meter to check your glucose levels and an insulin pump, or if you're less lucky, a needle to adjust those levels. Typically, a diabetic repeats the same procedure throughout the day. They check their blood, they adjust their insulin level manually according to some heuristics about that glucose level, and they wait until it's been a while or they notice symptoms of how low or um, high blood sugar and rinse repeat. The holy grail, if you're a diabetic, would be an artificial pancreas, a system that monitors your blood sugar and has its own internal heuristics that are personalized to your body to inject insulin. Or at least when you measure your blood sugar, it would automatically respond appropriately with those heuristics. Um, that was the idea behind the closed loop, a system developed by diabetics and their carers uh, they use the data from glucose monitors to build personal heuristics, and uh, they got it. And they used standard uh, medical pumps from Medtronic. Just uh, they were easily adapted because um, the authentication code was the six-digit serial number uh, of the device in plain text, and it was publicly known since 2011, but Medtronic just didn't really care until it started cutting into their profits. And then suddenly this vulnerability was grounds for a recall of the pumps um, that could be used for a closed loop, even though these DIY systems like uh, Omnipod uh, relied on the same pairing protocol as the standard controls, 
So device manufacturers have portrayed it as an exploit that creates a security risk, even though it's just using the same controls as the standard controls. So uh, device manufacturers would sometimes claim, oh, this is a regulatory issue. Uh, they claimed they couldn't document their own APIs because it would be promoting off-label use, which was prohibited. But now America's Food and Drug Administration has added designations for pumps that allow third-party access, the ICGM, which is an interoperable glucose monitor, and the ACE pump, which is a alternate controller-enabled pump. Uh, and yet these device manufacturers have completely failed to enable diabetics to freely treat themselves, uh, even though they have the ability to in America at least. Uh, one monitor manufacturer, Abbott Labs, even went after a free tool for accessing your own medical data because they claimed a copyright violation against them, Diabetech. Uh, so this isn't about security and it's not about regulation. It's about protecting their own profits because they have failed to offer products that are as good as what diabetic hackers create for themselves. The next thing I want to talk about is the contempt that developers and engineers have for accessibility work. A lot of people see this as less interesting than more prestigious areas uh, so a lot of the essential work actually gets left to women, which is very noticeable in tech fields where there often aren't many women. Uh, in fact, a lot of the essential work of building platforms and products within companies is uh, left to disabled people themselves, as though the only reason you could possibly care about this is if you are going to have to use it. Obviously, Hopefully, uh, you may have gotten from the rest of my talk that I'm entirely in favor of disabled people being enabled to fulfill their own needs. Every individual has different needs. We should be able to build the tools for our work and lives, but we shouldn't always have to. And yet this is an expectation of us. Uh, my aforementioned blind friend, who is an extremely skilled systems programmer, was assigned to an accessibility team for years doing work that wasn't actually what he was excited about. And I work in language model research. Uh, language model plays a part in many kinds of systems, machine translation, conversation, question answering. And yet anyone I meet immediately assumes if they know about my disability that I work in speech recognition. Uh, but like, I don't work on anything that has an application for me personally. I don't work on anything that is in any kind of application area. I do interpretability research, which is pretty far from anything in the applied world. Uh, so one problem that emerges though, uh, because of all of this sort of contempt for the field is a lack of qualified and skilled programmers working in accessibility. And that means that products are often badly engineered. Uh, insulin pumps often have vulnerabilities that you could literally use to kill a person because if you dump a lot of insulin into someone's body, they die and they often never get fixed. Essential updates are released really slowly, if at all. Uh, the, the Dexcom glucose monitor provides updates to the Apple Health app, uh, but delays them by three hours, for instance. And initially, this was to conform with FDA designation, but they now have the interoperability designation, which I mentioned. And that means they could be updating on time, but they don't have the upgrade to update in real time. And the only real explanation at this point is that they can't recruit enthusiastic qualified people who are proactive in upgrading that app. Building a team like that is always gonna be hindered by the contempt that skilled developers have towards accessibility work and adaptive technology. Now, I wanna talk about patronizing attitudes that uh, we have towards disabled people. 
Our society does not trust disabled people to take care of their own needs or be authorities on their own conditions. And uh, this is a problem that starts on the most direct level with doctors. And so I'm going to rant to you about doctors. My first diagnosis was fibromyalgia, which is a way of dismissing a patient that you don't have a diagnosis for. So doctors will rarely try to actually find out the cause if they've already declared you have fibromyalgia, which is just like fibromyalgia. It's a way of repeating your symptoms back at you. Uh, but then the mechanism of my pain was discovered, which is small fiber neuropathy, which means I'm missing nerves that transmit heat and pain, which causes a kind of phantom limb syndrome kind of thing in my feet and hands. Uh, I got this diagnosis in America through a skin biopsy, which is a standard procedure for diagnosing throughout uh, America, England, pretty much the whole world, but not in Scotland, where I now live. So when I saw a neurologist in Scotland solely for the purpose of having my diagnosis in my Scottish medical records, the neurologist wasn't familiar with the test, um, and I needed him to sign off on this because... I needed painkillers. Um, Scotland doesn't actually have a test for small fiber neuropathy, though. Instead, the neurologist wrote down that he suspected significant functional overlay. Keep in mind, this is how I do scare quotes. Uh, this is the way that a doctor directly says that pain is just all in your head. So that means when I next saw my GP, he refused to send me to any more doctors or prescribe me painkillers uh, and instead offered to send me to a psychologist who would help me to resolve the underlying issues that I had with my mother that were the underlying true cause of my pain. And I was then ejected from his office for saying the word fuck. Um, Eventually, I found an actual neuropathy specialist in Glasgow, so I now have my actual diagnosis on the record in Scotland. Yeah. So, we don't have a culture that respects disabled people or trusts them to know their own needs. The diabetic hacker community passes around nightmare stories about doctors that won't treat them because they aren't using the standard systems, but they have these really great shirts that say deliberately non-compliant. Yeah. Uh, but now I'm going to talk to you as an ally for disabled people. First off, uh, consider working in accessibility tech. We need data scientists to develop better cybernetic medical technology. We need better data engineers to ensure that we have access to our own data, possibly in real time. And we need better developers in general who are aware of what's required of them to make a product accessible but secure. Uh, if you're an employer, you need to understand that you have to give disabled programmers space. This is especially true if they're in the early stages of learning to adapt to their disability. Uh, they're going to take time to learn to use new tools, and the kind of work they do might evolve. I spent a lot more time reading papers as an element of my research than I used to do when all I wanted to do was hack. But uh, for me, my biggest allies have been people who find me private offices. I can't dictate in an open office environment without me wanting to kill everyone around me who's making noise and them wanting to kill me for just talking continually at a computer for hours and hours on end. So if you want to accommodate voice coding, you've got to ditch open office environments. They're productivity killers anyway, it's known a lot of people are just not going to play well with them anyway. Uh, why is this really relevant to you though? Um, I wanna to talk to you as a crumbling sack of bones and flesh that will inevitably decay because you are an athlete. You are an athlete who sits on your ass all day using your fingers, which are like the bits of your bodies that are least well adapted to constant use. 
normal athletes, like if you worked for football or something, have physical therapists and masseuses, and that's just part of their job. But it's likely that you don't have that as part of your job. Uh, and it should change, honestly, but I want to give a few quick tips for if you find that your hands have been failing you. Um, I'm going to explain this to you because I learned a lot, actually, about hands uh, through my journey since it took me over a year to get a diagnosis that's like, I don't have a repetitive stress injury. So yeah, I can tell you all about how the little arms on the end of your big arms, ah, they are um, very delicate. So... There are three big nerves going down your arm. There's the radial nerve that travels up the back of your hand. And if you pain, feel pain there, it might indicate that you're crunching your wrist when you type with your palm facing too much upward rather than parallel to the forearm. I hope everyone can actually see that. The ulnar nerve then travels up the pinky. And I would say the most common injury to it in programmers is Emacs pinky, where you're constantly cording your hand to reach the escape key. The most common injuries, however, are uh, the median nerve, which travels along the thumb and pointer finger. And that's the one you've always got to watch out for. Uh, often, though, the tension or inflammation that you're dealing with isn't anywhere close to the hands. Keep in mind, your nerves might be pinched further up because those nerves do come out of the neck. And a lot of programmers have really bad posture. I'm not going to give you a big lecture about ergonomics because there's a lot of information available about that. But it might be working worth uh, looking into as an athlete. So... The most important preventative measure is going to be taking breaks. If you do some kind of Pomodoro time where you set a timer for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break, you're already doing really great. That's the ideal setup in terms of taking breaks. Uh, this is a weird piece of advice that I have found it really helpful personally. Um, it's uh, when you sit down at a table, don't lift your hands from below. Instead, bring them around and feel how much it opens your shoulder. Just like try it right now because nobody's going to see you looking silly because you're all just at home. So like just feel how it changed your posture. Um, the next piece of advice I have for you is that you should be taking breaks uh, if you want to prevent, uh, like the cording that I mentioned that the Emacs pinky thing, uh, you should actually be using both shift keys. Um, a lot of people will rely on say the left side, which means that they press a key on the left side when they're stretching and they, they stretch their hand to like, reach both shift and that key. So if you try using the right key when you can press the left-handed letter, um, then that can really help with pain, uh, even if it's kind of hard to build up that habit. My next piece of advice is that you should be taking breaks. Uh, Whoop, exercise has been uh, legitimately shown to help with inflammatory conditions. So if you want to prevent inflammation and tension or you want to resolve uh, inflammation that's been building up, uh, then you should try exercising more. And um, my next piece of advice is that you should take breaks. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> Uh, you can stretch or exercise during your breaks, and that's actually really good for you. So uh, the only real radial nerve stretch I know is just stretching literally like the back of the hand. Um, and here I'm doing it on the camera. I hope people can see me. Mm. Then the ulnar nerve stretch I know is a lot more fun if you can, uh, if you can do it right now. It's like just... Try to do the weird 
glasses hands. And if you feel it along the side of your arm under the pinky, then that's doing a good ulnar stretch. Uh, and then the, um, whoop, yes, the median nerve stretch that you should try is that you tilt your head to one shoulder, you take the opposite arm from that shoulder and you just stretch it out and unfurl the fingers. And you should probably feel that stretch because it's because probably your median nerves gets uh, need some loving. So, um, don't overdo that, by the way. Don't like stretch all the time because that's also not good for you. Anyway, what if it's too late and you're already feeling a lot of pain building up? You can't type much anymore. Um, first off, stop typing. Stop using your phone. Just take a break. Try using comfortable hand braces. I like ones that are specifically labeled as night braces because they're just enormous pillows that uh, go on your hands. I actually use them for a different purpose, which is that when I go to conferences, I have these huge pillows on my hands. So when people try to shake my hand, they just shake the pillow so it doesn't hurt my hand. Normally, handshakes are excruciating. Uh, yeah. So just try that. And, um, and uh, it's completely legitimate to try taking an anti-inflammatory if you're having pain from inflammation, um, especially because there's this inflammatory cycle. It's not very well understood medically, but, uh, but you might want to ice your wrists and in order to also prevent inflammation. But if you're doing stuff that prevents inflammation, do not touch your keyboard again until you are feeling 100% better because what you're doing is uh, preventing the healing process that should be responding to you doing the damage of using your keyboard. So responding to inflammation pain with anti-inflammatory strategies is fine, but don't keep hurting your hands while you're doing it. Uh, you might want to get some uh, ergonomic keyboards uh, or a mouse. Uh, and you might want to try doing trigger point massage on yourself because if you've got some knot or something further towards the neck, that could be the cause of pain. Uh, so if that didn't work, you should probably see a physical therapist or a doctor, but um, a doctor might not be enough. And it might be time to start dictating code or doing some other kind of adaptation that allows you to continue your work as well as whatever else you enjoy. So, hmm. When you're in this much pain, it is tempting though to think of yourself as in a waiting room, that the pain is something you just have to wait out until a doctor fixes you and you can resume your life. Um, I don't care if you find that miracle cure, there's no resuming your life because this is your life, this whole bit that you're living in. Uh, so do not let a year go by just trapped in the metaphorical waiting room. It took me a long time to realize that it was time for me to do things that made my life enjoyable in the moment, like learning to dictate code uh, rather than waiting for someone to fix me. Uh, but I needed that. Uh, and I needed to change how I was living my life in order to reflect what I could do. So I want to talk about one of my favorite books. It's this in extremely skinny memoir. You just read it. It takes like an hour or two. Uh, it's called The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. In it, the author is completely bedbound and unable to even just turn her head. She doesn't have the energy to read or follow a film or listen to music. So one day a friend brings her a bouquet of flowers and it has a snail on it and she just watches the snail. And she watches that snail for like almost a year, learning its habits, developing this kinship with the slow, like neglected little creature. And she re 
as she recovers, uh, she learns about the biology of snails from like academic books and the way that she talks about snails. It's like, uh, it's like the way she talks about a snail in prose is it's got more like affection and attention than I've read in a lot of love poetry. And this author thought in the moment that she was in this waiting room waiting to recover but she was just living this profoundly different life from what she was used to and that's what you need to do inspiration words stop waiting if you are feeling like you've been in pain for a long time so uh here i want to read one quote from it as the snail's world grew more familiar, my own human world became less so. My species was so large, so rushed, and so confusing. I found myself preoccupied with the energy level of my visitors, and I started to observe them in the same detail with which I observed the snail. The random way my friend moved around the room astonished me. It was as if they didn't know what to do with their own energy. They were so careless about it. They were spontaneous. Uh, there were spontaneous gestures of their arms, the toss of a head, a sudden bend into a full body stretch as if it were nothing at all, or they might comb their fingers unnecessarily through their hair. And the way that you experience the world does change like this when you become disabled because you have to put so much thought into your body's new needs because a lot of things that you used to take for granted become untenable. And, um, and like, you really do have to start thinking about how to adapt the tools around you so that they still can serve you. <clears throat> so one more thing. Uh, if you hear about someone overcoming what I've overcome and adapting to what I've adapted to, it's very easy to have one of two responses. It's, I could never do that, or it can't be that hard. And you have to let go of both of those because it is that hard and you can do it. Okay. I am done with my talking section or with that part of my talking. I have, there's a Q&A. Cool. Yeah, thank you very much, Naomi. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the Q&A and everyone who's watching right now can still submit their questions. Uh -huh. One of the first questions we got was from Karsten, who is asking that if, if you're someone who wants to work in accessibility tech, do you have any tips on where to get started or also maybe related? Are you aware of any open source projects that might be interesting to contribute to, to help accessibility tech? Oh, that's a good question. Um, since, since I don't work in accessibility tech, I might not be able to answer it super well, uh, but uh, there are definitely open source projects. I've mentioned a few of them. Uh, I think that the diabetic, uh, the diabetic uh, response thing could actually use improved models, honestly, if you are a person who works in time series stuff. Uh, and um, like, yeah, I'm trying to think of specific open source projects that have uh, that I've run into. I'll, I'll put a bookmark in that. But also, uh, most companies do have an accessibility team, actually. So there's um, like adapt, uh, adaptive technology, which is it's whole, a whole other thing. It's um, maybe you wanted to work on like a, uh, the, the actual tools, like har the, the hardware that's developed or, you know, dictation software, uh, that kind of thing. But accessibility is actually a team on a, in a lot of big companies. Uh, so one thing I would recommend is to just start thinking about how tools that you're already working with might be made more accessible and uh, who they are for and uh, how you might come up with a way to make them more freely available for everyone. Um, yeah. So... I think that's where I'm at in terms of uh, that question. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you very much. We also have some other questions. Um, Andrew asks if you have looked at Open Humans. I'm not familiar myself with Open Humans, but he says they're a foundation that provides a platform from, for aggregating data for patient-driven research. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? I actually haven't. Uh, I have run into um, there's the the one that I've run into is actually one where you like post all of your information and then it's like there's a bounty for doctors to look at it. And I wonder uh, and I wonder how the stuff that's posted on. Uh, okay, it's 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 another one that I have to put a bookmark in anyway. But how the patients who post on uh, looking for a bounty, like looking for a doctor who can tell them what's wrong, uh, how they differ from people who are just going to post their data and uh, and hope that in aggregate it's meaningful. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of this. I think is uh, is stuff that that is ultimately very, uh, very individualized. And, uh, and a lot of the edge cases are people who are, who have really, really rare issues. Um, when it comes to cluster headaches, actually, I don't want to be like that person, but, uh, but I'm really interested in, um, I'm really interested in the, the effect of like uh, electric uh, stimulation, not just like I know someone who got ECT because their cluster headaches were so bad that they were really, really depressed for years and years and years and the ECT cured the headache. So I'm always really interested in that. Wow. So I don't know if Open Humans has that data. Anyway. Yeah, well, thank you. Then lastly, before we move on to the next speaker, we have two questions from Derek. He asks if it is possible to you to code with Talon instead of, inside of VS Code, and also if there are some uh, similarity between Talon voice commands and Vim commands. If it helps you to uh, learn Talon if you're already familiar with Vim. Uh, there's a so so there's a, someone has a really solid library for Vim. That's a that's an easy question I can answer. Uh, someone has a really solid library for coding in Vim, um, where a lot of the common things that you would do are just their own uh, are their own commands. But also because it's a phonetic alphabet, uh, it's easy to map your phonetic alphabet onto a lot of the Vim commands. Um, and as for VS Code, I think I've seen that as a library in the community repository, but I actually use Atom, so I it hasn't drawn my eye specifically, yeah. Oh, I see Nelson has another question about whether vocal strain has become an issue with dictating code and how I deal with that. The answer is yes. Um, you can't really code for the same amount of time if you're exclusively coding by voice, but there's a more kind of intense answer to that, which actually goes back to the doctor thing. Doctors are terrible, I'm sorry. Um, so I got tonsillitis in September and it turned out to be antibiotic resistant, uh, which I knew because I took antibiotics and then it um, went away for like all of two weeks and then it came back immediately. And I couldn't speak for any of that and I couldn't write for any of that and I couldn't type for any of that which is a really frustrating existence. Um, but uh, the tonsillitis came back. And when the tonsillitis came back, I would go to my doctor every single week going, I can't speak at all. Because, uh, because of my neurological issues, it, it, I, it's like it, it, it was a very intense aggravation of a nerve. Um, and my doctor every single week would give me a lecture about how you can't overuse antibiotics on things that are clearly just viruses. And then finally was like, this is just your condition. You're just going to be like this forever. You can't talk. That's just how it is. Uh, and you can't write. You can't type. Now you can't talk. And that's the way that neurological issues go. And then I went to a dentist and the dentist was like, oh, this is tonsillitis, which is something you can tell if you look in my mouth. Anyway, 
So a couple more re recurrences of that tonsillitis and I had to get a tonsillectomy. And after the tonsillectomy, I had complications involving the same nerve because that nerve had just been aggravated by months, by like over a month of untreated tonsillitis and then months of like repeatedly having to suppress it with antibiotics. Um, and that was, that made it impossible to code. It was so frustrating. Uh, and so I guess the answer there is you can sustain damage in a lot of ways to your throat, uh, including just having a cold or something like that. And that means that you cannot code. Like I live in total fear of getting just a normal cold because I know that for a week, I'm not going to be able to cold, code, cold, code. Yeah. So all of these things can cause uh, stress to the throat. And, it's, and dictating for too long is one of those. I would actually recommend if you dictate for long periods of time that you see a vocal coach because they have practice in telling people how they can effectively reduce strain while dictating for long periods of time. And uh, other than that, you just have to stay really well hydrated. Okay. Okay, it's in point, yeah. Well, thank mm -hmm. you very much. I want to thank you very much for agreeing to be our keynote. I think your story was very inspiring, and I think it's always good to be really aware of accessibility issues. And I think we've all learned something in the past 45 minutes.